James H. Deal Veterinary Public Health Award nominations. And OIE has a 2019 photo competition where entries are being accepted through April 15th. Some upcoming events of interest include NACHO's 2019 Vector Summit in Pittsburgh, the 68th Annual EIS Conference in Atlanta, and the 2019 CSTE Annual Conference in Raleigh, North Carolina. There are also some observances coming up for National Wildlife Week in March, National Public Health Week in April, and National Pet Week in May. We've shared some recent public publications, including one on the citywide control of Aedes aegypti during the 2016 Zika epidemic in Puerto Rico, as well as several relevant updates in MMWR, including one to highlight on human brucella abortus RB51 infections caused by the consumption of unpasteurized domestic dairy products. There's also a new outbreak notice that was released on exposures to drug-resistant brucellosis linked to raw milk, and several ongoing outbreak investigations have been updated recently. As always, you can see a selected list of ongoing and past U.S. outbreaks of zoonotic diseases, as well as information on staying safe and healthy around animals on CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website. The complete CDC current outbreak list is also available at cdc.gov slash outbreaks. Lastly, if you would like for us to share news from your organization, or if you want to suggest presentation topics or even volunteer to present on a Zohu call, please contact us at zohucall at cdc.gov. Thanks for your support of the Zohu call and for joining us today. I'll now turn it back over to Helen. Thank you, Dr. Barton Baravesh. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following ob objectives. Describe two key points for, from each presentation. Describe how a multi-sectoral One Health approach can be applied to the presentation topics. Identify an implication for animal and human health. Identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention, detection, or response to public health threats. Identify two new resources from CDC partners. Questions for all presenters will be taken at the end of this call. Call 1-800-593-8936 and enter participant passcode 9611836. Press star 1 and give the operator your name and affiliation. Please name the presenter or topic at the beginning of your question. You'll find resources and links for all presentations on our website and in today's Zohu Call reminder email. Our first presentation, Mortality, Hospital Admission, and Healthcare Costs from Venomous and Non-Venomous Animal Encounters in the United States will be given by Dr. Joseph D. Forrester. Please begin when you're ready. All right. Thank you, Helen. To my slides here. So are you able to advance your slides? Uh, I'm not seeing, I'm just seeing blank slides on my screen right now. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I can advance them for you if you want to just tell me next slide if um, you have your slides available. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Thank you. All right. So uh, thank, thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, next slide. Uh, I have no financial disclosures to report. Uh, next slide. Animal-related injuries can be serious but are often discussed anecdotally or for isolated events. Animals can cause injury through blunt force, biting, stinging, and envenomation, and this holds true for wild animals, domesticated animals, and animals in the workplace. Prior mortality estimates have relied on county-level death certificate reports or limited epidemiologic assessments of small probability samples over short time periods. The aim of our research was to describe the modern epidemiology of animal-related injuries among persons presenting to U.S. emergency departments. Next slide. To do this, we performed a retrospective analysis of the National Emergency Department sample, abbreviated NEDS, through the rest of the talk, from 2010 to 2014. NEDS is the largest all-payer 
database in the United States and represents a stratified, unweighted sample of approximately 20% of all U.S. emergency departments. When analyzed accounting for survey methodology, NEDS provides national estimates of all U.S. ED visits. We identified all ED encounters associated with an animal-related injury through ICD-9 codes and excluded injuries acquired when an animal was being ridden and injuries between an animal and a person in a car, motorcycle, or bike. Primary outcomes we assessed included mortality, inpatient admission, and cost. Next slide. Variables we assessed are listed. We then used NEDS sampling strata and discharge weights to produce nationally weighted patient level estimates. We performed multivariate logistic regression compensating for survey methodology, and then used the hosmer lemeshaw test to ensure model validity and receiver operating characteristic curves to optimize models. Next slide. Through our analysis, we identified over 6 million ED admissions for animal-related injury, which corresponded to nearly 1.3 million admissions annually, or 410 animal-related injuries per 100,000 population. Mean patient age was 30.8 years, and 52% were female, although age and sex distribution varied considerably based upon the type of animal encountered, which I'll discuss on the next two slides. The most common animal groups associated with ED presentation included non-venomous arthropods, dogs, and hornets, wasps, and bees. Next slide. In this graph, you can see an example of some of the variation in age distribution. On the graph is the percentage of persons with animal-related injury by age group and animal type. You will note that venomous snake injury is more common in the 18 to 44 demographic, whereas non-venomous arthropod injury is more common in the youngest age group. Conversely, injury is associated with other animals, which are commonly farm or agricultural or related injuries, are more broadly distributed across the age groups. Next slide. Similarly, there was considerable sex discrepancy depending on animal type. In the graph below, you can see the percentage of persons presenting with animal-related injury by animal type. Notably, males are much more commonly seen presenting with venomous snake-related injury, dog bites are relatively equivocal, and females predominate among patients presenting with non-venomous, non-arthropod animal bites. Next slide. Most patients presented in states in the southern region, although again, this varied considerably by animal type. The primary payer source was either, either private insurance or Medicaid. As you can see in the graph on the right, depicting the number of persons injured by income quartile, most patients were in the lower half of their income percentile by zip code. Next slide. There were 210,000 patients admitted as inpatients. Bites from non-venomous arthropods accounted for the largest number of admissions among any animal group, although the highest frequency of admission occurred after a bite from a venomous snake or lizard. Only 1,162 deaths were recorded, or 0.02% of all encounters. Most of these occurred after hospital admission. Fatal encounters were most commonly identified after rat, venomous snake or lizard, or dog bites. Next slide. The results of our regression analysis are seen here. Not surprisingly, increased age and higher injury severity score were associated with greater odds of both hospital admission and death. While higher quartile of household income was associated with greater odds of hospital admission, it had no effect on death. Female sex appears to be protective, as female sex was associated with lower odds of both hospital admission and death. Next slide. We identified a cost of nearly $6 billion spent on animal-related injury over our five-year study period. Notably, this does not include physician, outpatient, or rehabilitation costs. 60% of all costs come after three types of animal encounters. These include dog, non-venomous arthropod, and venomous snake or lizard bites. Uh, next slide, please. Based on our analysis, we argue that animal-related injuries are an increasing burden to the U.S. healthcare system. When comparing our evaluation to prior smaller national level estimates, you can see that the number of animal related injuries per 100,000 persons has increased. Notably, the admission percentage has remained relatively constant. This suggests that the increase in animal related injuries are not due to more severe human animal interactions, but rather due to an increase in the overall frequency of human animal interactions. Next slide. Now, contrary to our last slide, we also identified a higher overall fatality rate. At first glance, this, means, this may seem counterintuitive, but we believe this is explained through our sampling strategy and study design. When evaluating our study against prior animal-related fatality estimates, you can see that our study has a considerably higher number of annual total deaths identified, as well as deaths per million person years. 
However, all these prior fatality estimates were based on county level death certificate data rather than survey data. This suggests that our observed increase in mortality was due to sampling strategy rather than a true increase. This hypothesis is consistent with the stable hospital admission frequency we observed over time. Next slide. Unfortunately, there are few available cost estimates for animal-related injury in the United States. An analysis of work-related animal injury from 2011 to 2014 estimated approximately $2.6 billion lost. This subpopulation corresponded to approximately 1.4% of the injuries identified in our analysis. Similarly, an analysis of the WISCARS database from 2010 estimated a total lifetime cost of $2.3 billion associated with hospitalization from animal-related injury, and an additional $7.7 .7 billion spent on patients who were treated and released from the ED. This subpopulation corresponded to approximately 94% of the injuries identified in our analysis. Now, our annual loss estimate of $1.2 billion does not account for physician charges, outpatient costs, cost of work loss, or injury rehabilitation. Extrapolating the findings from these other studies to our patient population suggests that approximately $13 billion is spent on animal-related injury annually. Next slide. Now, there are many limitations to our study, several of which I have listed here. First, only U.S. encounters were evaluated, limiting extrapolation to other countries. Second, misclassification bias may be present with ICD-9 coding and has been well described. Third, only event level data is reported. If one individual presented several times over the course of a year, they would be coded as multiple individuals. Fourth, categorization of encounters at the species level, other than for dogs, was not possible. We anticipate that this should improve as we transition to ICD-10 coding. Finally, sampling error may lead to overestimation or underestimation of animal-related injury, particularly for regionally variable animal groups. Next slide. Before I conclude, I would like to end with a couple of final thoughts. Injuries due to mountain lions, bears, alligators, and other large animals often attract considerable media attention. And while it is true that large animal habitat is shrinking and increasingly overlaps with human development and recreational activity, the reality is, is that most injuries occur from much smaller animals. Venomous and non-venomous arthropods accounted for nearly two-thirds of all injuries in our studies, and arthropod encounters are estimated to increase based on habitat availability and climate change. We hope that this is the message received by the public as a result of the publication of our data. Next slide. To conclude, the frequency of animal-related injury is increasing, although hospital admission rates and mortality rates have remained relatively stable. The healthcare burden of animal-related injury is considerable and may be underappreciated. Understanding animal-related injury in the United States and developing effective public health prevention is critical now, given projected increases in the number of animal-related encounters. And that's it. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, our next presentation, Environmental Observation, Social Media, and One Health Action in Alaska, will be given by Dr. Emily Mastidis. Please begin when you're ready. Thanks, Helen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm an epidemiologist at the CDC Arctic Investigations Program in Anchorage, Alaska. I'm going to describe a social media network that was described that was developed by the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. But first, let's picture the Arctic. Picture vast tundras, mountain ranges, and rivers. Picture communities that are dotted throughout the landscape, sometimes separated by hundreds of miles. And flying, boating, or sledding are often the only means of transportation between them. Imagine people who live in close proximity to working and companion animals, and sometimes uncomfortably close proximity to wildlife. Now picture that these people and animals are experiencing large-scale environmental changes, thawing permafrost leading to sinkholes and erosion, delayed winter freezes affecting winter snowmobile travel and wildlife ranges, and expanding wildfires affecting air quality. In a setting like this, where people are geographically dispersed, in close relationships with animals and the environment, and experiencing these environmental changes, how can we best protect health? Are traditional public health systems enough? I'm going to tell you about an alternative means of public health action using the Local Environmental Observer, or LEO network, 
which was developed by the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium in 2012. LEO is a social media platform that brings together local observers with experts to share information about unusual animal, environmental, or weather events. You might notice right away that health is not mentioned anywhere in the description of the LEO network. In fact, it's not a health-related monitoring system at all. Even so, the network has engendered one health action in Alaska. I'll describe how this system works and give three examples of how this one health action came about. The LEO network currently has 2,800 members. To join, each member fills out a profile with their community and affiliated organization, like their tribe or where they work. They can add interest areas in the category shown by the icons on the right. They define their knowledge backgrounds based on whether or not they have scientific, local, or indigenous influences. If a LEO member notices something unusual in their environment that they'd like to report, they submit a narrative on their mobile app or the website. The system assigns a community and topic area hub, which is an editorial group that helps coordinate observations. These coordinators at the hub determine if the observation should be posted based on a few criteria, such as whether or not it's sufficiently specific, was witnessed by the observer, and if there's enough content. Based on those criteria, the coordinators recommend it for publication or not. If they decide to publish it, they then identify other LEO members who are content area experts to serve as consultants on the observation. The co consultants review the observation and provide comments. LEO coordinators then add further resources. And finally, the observation, the comments, and resources are posted on LEO and shared through Facebook and other social media platforms. Observations, once they're published, are plotted on a map. Hundreds of observations have already been made throughout Alaska. Examples from February of this year include an observation of early breeding among um, trumpeter swans in southeast Alaska, and unusual flooding in a community in western Alaska. Helen, can you confirm that the slides are changing? Um, right now we're on the one that says making an environmental observation and all eight of the boxes are showing. Okay. Not on the presenter thing anymore for some reason. I'm not sure what's happening, but I'm happy to um, advance. Okay. Can you go to um, the next one? The one that says Leo Network Observations? Yes, that's right. Yep, got it. Thanks. Let me know when you're ready. To the next one. Okay. Um, you can go to the next one now. Thanks. Leo also creates groups of related observations called projects which allow trends in the observations to be identified. Of course, keeping in mind that this is not a typical monitoring system. These are narrative observations. Projects can be initiated in two ways. Um, click. They can be started by the LEO coordinators who identify a trend and will ask an air topic area expert to serve as the lead. Or they can be started at the request of a scientist who um, request that members make observations. For example, um, next. Scientists in Alaska are concerned about the importation of dog ticks, which do not have an established population in Alaska. So they've requested that members up upload observation of ticks when they find them. Next. So how has this network led to One Health Action? I'll give you three examples, all starting with S fire, fish, and frost. Next. Starting off with an observation of fire. An observer posted an observation in a community on the coast of Norton Sound. Normally, the area surrounding his community had good vis visibility and looked like this. Next. But over the past few days, wildfire smoke, next, was quickly encroaching. He took pictures at a few time points and posted on the LEO network. Next. The LEO coordinators requested input from the Alaska Fire Science Consortium, and the consultants let the observer know that there were currently seven wildfires burning in the vicinity of his community. Next. They connected him to information about how to protect health and poor air quality. 
And the LEO coordinators added the observation to a project showing several wildfires across the circumpolar north. Next. An observer in the yukon Kuskokwim Delta posted an observation regarding smelt that he and others in his community had caught. Next. Normally, smelt are small fish that are tasty when fried. Next. But these smelt were showing up with large black lesions. The observer posted pictures on the LEO network. Next. The LEO network coordinators requested consultations from the yukon Kuskokwim Health Center the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and the Alaska Marine Advisory Program. Next. A fish pathologist from the Department of Fish and Game was able to identify that the fish was infected with a fungus called phaohyphomycosis. The fungus does not usually cause human infection, but it could in the context of immune suppression. The pathologist recommended not eating the fish. The LEO network coordinators alerted other relevant agencies to the observation in case additional action was necessary. Next. Finally, frost. This example is a project set up of observations throughout Alaska regarding permafrost. Permafrost exists when soil, rocks, and water remain below 32 degrees for at least two years. It's ubiquitous through Alaska and normally looks like this. Next. However, observations came into the LEO network showing that permafrost thaws have impacted infrastructure that could have an effect on health. Next. Here, the first picture shows a food storage cellar that normally stays cold throughout the summer but flooded as the permafrost warmed. The second picture is of sinking water treatment plant foundation, and the last is of coastal erosion that's threatening the walls of a nearby sewage lagoon. Next. The LEO network coordinators designated a project lead from the Tribal Health Consortium Engineering Department and requested input from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Next. The project ended up collating five observations of environmental damage to infrastructure that could have consequences specifically for, fruit, for foodborne and waterborne diseases. Next. These examples are just the start of potential collaborations and action that could come about from the LEO network. There are still some areas for growth. Increased membership and observations in LEO would improve its representativeness. This would allow for further examination of trend data to inform the state of environmental change. Also, formally evaluating the system could be, yield even more insight into how it's impacting human, animal, and environmental health. Next. I hope throughout this talk you've been thinking about how this system is not only relevant to the Arctic, if you were thinking that, you would be completely correct. Although LEO started in Alaska, members can join from all over the world. This map shows communities of members globally. Next. If you're interested in becoming an observer or just checking out to see if anything is going on in your area, you can join the LEO network at www.leonetworks.org. Next. In conclusion, a changing environment is going to require a big picture and alternative solutions when it comes to protecting health. The LEO network is a way to connect communities to experts and fits into a growing collection of One Health resources. Ultimately, it has the potential to provide insight into environmental changes globally. Thank you. Thank you. Our final presentation, Prescription Opioid Epidemic, Do Veterinarians Have a Dog in the Fight? is by Dr. Lee S. Newman. Please begin when you're ready. Great, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you all taking a few minutes for a somewhat different and uh, deeply disturbing topic uh, that I hope will result in some call to action. Uh, the, uh, the, as an overview, what I'd like to cover today is a bit of the One Health perspective on the prescription opioid epidemic. Uh, I'll touch on a recent study on diversion of veterinary prescription opioids by, um, by clients and the possibility of harm to animals and humans. I'll touch on some uh, emerging data on the rise in opioid prescribing practices uh, in the veterinary community. Uh, we'll talk about the implications and uh, some uh, uh, calls to action. Uh, I could pull up any of a number of slides, but you'd have to be uh, living under a rock to not be aware of the human uh, prescription opioid epidemic and the fatalities, the overdoses that we're seeing. This is just one of many illustrations just to remind us all 
of the, the fact that, uh, example here, uh, opioid overdoses per 10,000 emergency room visits uh, is continuing to, uh, to, to rise across the country. Uh, even as uh, I'll touch later on the fact that we're starting to see some tailing off, some reduction in the total number of opioids being prescribed uh, by uh, physicians treating human patients. Uh, it's a, obviously a very serious epidemic, and you're all aware of that. One approach to this is to try to reduce the supply side of prescribed opioids in the supply and demand equation. Uh, it, clearly a multifactorial problem. Uh, one of the goals, not the only goal, is to reduce the supply of prescription opioids that are not being used as intended um, to identify potential sources of diversion and abuse. And uh, towards this end, uh, uh, the vast amount of attention has focused on the pharmaceutical industry, pharmacies, uh, human medical providers, dentists, other prescribers, but veterinary practices have been largely overlooked. Um, uh, we published a, a, a perspective piece in the American Journal of Public Health last August, which uh, uh, starts to uh, give us a, a little bit of a numerator, but certainly uh, nowhere near the kind of data that we need, but enough to raise our awareness that there is a problem in the veterinary prescribing practices in terms of potential diversion. Uh, and so what we want to talk about today are what are some of the positive things that the veterinary community can be doing to help address this one health problem. Uh, I want to acknowledge Derek Mason, uh, Lily Tenney, uh, Peter Hellyer, uh, who are co-authors on that piece with me. Uh, the, um, uh, in that piece, uh, we talked about the extent of opioid prescribing practices uh, by veterinarians as being uncertain. Uh, and I, I think what was striking to us when we embarked on this research was how little was uh, in the literature on the subject. The magnitude of possible diversion and misuse of animal prescriptions of opioids is at this point unknown, um, but has implications for human and animal suffering. Um, our research was stimulated by anecdotes from veterinarians. Uh, uh, Lily Tenney and I had been working on this issue of the opioid epidemic since 2010, and we started hearing from veterinarians that they were aware of uh, misuse diversion uh, related to um, themselves. Uh, staff members uh, and uh, clients bringing in um, their their animals uh, and in some cases potentially even harming or misleading the practitioner in order to obtain opioids that might not have gotten into appropriate use with the animal. Uh, so we started this work in 2014 conducting focus groups, meeting with veterinary organizations here in Colorado, uh, uh, collaborating with the Department of Regulatory Agencies, um, and uh, we conducted a survey. And the survey was uh, directed at a number of questions. We wanted to know, do veterinarians feel that they play a role in preventing opioid diversion? Uh, we wanted to understand the utilization of our state's prescription drug monitoring program. Uh, many states do not require veterinarians uh, to, uh, to enter data into, into that program. Uh, the awareness of abuse and misuse in their clinics and what resources they needed to be better at helping to address the issue. Um, we conducted a, a convenient sample, uh, which was responded to by 189 Colorado veterinarians who are members of our state and veterinary medical society. Uh, in no way is this sophisticated science. Uh, it's a relatively small sample, but it's a, a numerator sufficient to tell us that uh, we're, we're learning uh, that there's a problem that needs greater investigation. This describes the population of people who responded to our survey, and you can see that on average they've been in practice about 22 years, mostly in small animal. Uh, half of them in suburban practice, but with rural and urban representation as well. Uh, here are a few of our key observations. 13% um, of the respondents were aware that an animal owner had intentionally made an animal ill, injured an animal, or made an animal seem ill or injured in order to obtain opioids. 44% uh, were aware of opioid abuse or misuse by a client or a veterinary staff um, a member. And what fell off the bottom of this slide is that 12% were aware of veterinary staff opioid abuse and diversion. And this is of, um, of concern as well. Um, the, uh, the other key observation, 73%, uh, indicated that they, their veterinary medical school training on opioid abuse or misuse they considered to be fair, poor, or absent. And 
you know, on average, these are folks who had been out of, uh, out of school for uh, perhaps 20 years, although uh, even looking at the trends for the more recent graduates, uh, we got the very clear message that um, veterinary medical school training was still not addressing this uh, One Health problem. 64% uh, said they had not completed any continuing education on best practices for prescribing opioids since entering practice, and it fell off the bottom of the slide, but 36% recommended improving the PDMP guidelines and tutorials for veterinarians. Um, so uh, let me tell you a little bit of the, uh, of the experience that we've had since uh, publishing that perspective piece. Uh, first of all, for those of you who, who track statistics like this, the altmetrics on this particular article were extraordinary um, in the top 5% of all research outputs scored by altmetrics uh, with uh, more than 20 or you know, over 27 news stories and various outlets, mostly keying into this possibility that pet owners are abusing animals to get opioids. Uh, this certainly caught the public's eye. It's not the only observation that we made, but it certainly is the one that, um, that uh, rocketed to attention. Um, uh, there was a, a prompt FDA response. Uh, the, um, uh, the FDA commissioner, Scott Gottlieb, uh, uh, reported that a few weeks later of new FDA resource guides that had been put up uh, on their website. Uh, on that website, for people who are interested, there's, uh, there's now some information about the opioid epidemic and what veterinarians uh, need to know. I'm not going to go through the details of this, but I want to highlight that this site exists. It's in my references. You can Google it easily. Um, but it's starting to at least put in front of veterinarians some messaging. How do you know if a client or employee may be abusing opioids? And what are some of the warning signs that veterinary staff may be abusing opioids? And so um, I, I refer, refer you to that site because right now uh, there is uh, relatively little out there for veterinarians to turn to uh, to learn what they need to know about how to address this issue. Uh, I, I want to shift gears just slightly to a, a, a paper which gets, um, takes a, a, another angle on this issue. And it was a, a very nicely done paper um, by uh, folks at uh, University of Pennsylvania uh, trying to get at the question of, well, if, if we're describing uh, the, the veterinarians saying that we know about misuse and abuse, we, we're all asking the question, well, how, how much of these drugs are really being prescribed in veterinary practice? They conducted a cross-sectional study, an inventory of all opioid tablets and patches dispensed or prescribed in a multi-specialty um, academic practice at University of Pennsylvania. And then they also looked at some statewide veterinary prescribing data. And I just want to highlight this for folks because if you may not have seen this since it appeared in uh, JAMA uh, Network. Uh, I've yet to see a, a substantive paper published in the veterinary uh, literature, and, and I'm happy to have people up, uh, tell me that I've missed something. Um, but in this JAMA Network piece, uh, this, uh, this graph uh, shows a couple of very uh, startling observations, at least for me, uh, since I'm not a veterinarian. First of all, in, in um, the first graph at the top, uh, this is the, the number of tablets or patches of opioids that were prescribed each year. As you can see, this is over, an, over, over a uh, period from 2007 to 2017. Uh, and what you can see in this graph is that uh, the, the number of uh, hydrocodone prescriptions and codeine prescriptions have been going up. Uh, the tramadol prescriptions have been going down. Um, the, the authors suggest that may be due to the recognition that tramadol is relatively ineffective for treating pain in, in certain animals. Um, and if you look at the bottom graph, uh, these are the morphine milligram equivalents. Probably the most startling finding um, uh, of this paper is that overall we're seeing a substantial increase in the total amount of opioid drug that's making it into uh, the hands of, um, of, uh, of clients. Uh, when they bring their animals in. And one of the most striking observations by these researchers was that even though their practice had, I think, about an 11% or 12% uh, increase in total visits over this 11-year time span, the amount of opioids being prescribed rose 41%. That's 41%. And, uh, and you know, maybe somebody can uh, find another explanation for why the, the need for prescribing that amount of opioids increased as much as it did, especially in more recent years. Um, but it certainly uh, raises, for me, the suspicion 
that there is going to be diversion and misuse by the people who are receiving those prescriptions for their animals. The authors concluded that by increasing, that there's uh, increasing volume of opioids prescribed at this one veterinary teaching hospital. Uh, the concerns are parallel to those about excessive opioid prescribing in humans. And um, they, they noted an opportunity to assess the risk of veterinary opioid prescribings in order to safeguard uh, public health, that that's an important um, opening part of the story that we need to conclude. Uh, I want to just uh, take it one step further, though, and show you that for the, for the so uh, I showed you the statistics for one veterinary practice in Pennsylvania. If you look at this Pennsylvania example, uh, and I'm not picking on Pennsylvania, although it is one of the states with some of the highest rates of uh, human opioid unintended fatalities in the country. Um, but in Pennsylvania, human prescriptions were declining at the same time that uh, these authors were reporting uh, a, a change in a rise in animal prescriptions, uh, and particularly for the ones that are of concern. So if you, if you see here, uh, the message is be getting out to, um, to medical doctors that they need to uh, uh, reduce the number of prescriptions and the, uh, the doses that they're distributing. And in Pennsylvania, between 2015 and 2017, there was an 8 percent decline in prescriptions for oxycodone, a 24 percent drop in hydrocodone. And, uh, and yet, at the same time, uh, the, these authors were describing a rise in the, in the prescriptions of these drugs for pets, for animals. Um, I, I might add that um, in the same time period, uh, I'm sad to say that in September 2018, the DEA uh, released a 200-page report on the opioid threat in Pennsylvania and characterized uh, the availability of the prescription drugs. Um, and nowhere in that document is there any mention of animals or of veterinarians or veterinary practice. So we're getting this on to the radar now. Uh, I think that uh, we're hopefully stimulating uh, more uh, uh, action in terms of tracking and surveillance. I think it's going to be important that the veterinary community align with other DEA license holders, including PDMP use. Uh, right now, I think it's only about half of the states um, that uh, require in any, uh, you know, to any degree for veterinarians to um, be registered or to use their, their um, online prescription drug monitoring program. Uh, I think that needs to change. Uh, there uh, is a need to improve the tracking practices. We need to enhance workplace policies and practices so we minimize the amount of diversion, misuse, and abuse by the workers, by veterinarians themselves, and by people on their staff. And uh, you know, every veterinarian I've talked to has had a story to share about themselves uh, or somebody that they know in the practice. And we actually sadly lost a veterinarian to a, an opioid overdose here recently in the Denver metropolitan area. There needs to be more awareness and education for staff, for medical students, for practicing veterinarians. There needs to be more information on how to suspect, identify, and report animal mistreatment and diversion by clients related to the opioid epidemic. And, uh, and the veterinarians are telling us that they need better resources. They need to have a better idea of what they should be doing when they suspect. Uh, in terms of research gaps, I want to end by saying that we need uh, better research around the prescribing practices, the rates and the trends. Uh, the work from Pennsylvania certainly is giving us a hint uh, that uh, we have a large uh, number of prescriptions and doses being distributed into the community. We need to know better about that. We need to identify the extent to which uh, there is diversion. It may be that these drugs are going on to uh, medicine, into medicine cabinets or they're, or they're being used by the animals as prescribed. We don't really have the proof yet of diversion, but we have a strong suspicion. Uh, and uh, we also ultimately need better strategies for practitioners to use when they identify and want to report issues around this. And um, with that, um, uh, this uh, is, uh, again, my overview of what I hope to accomplish today. We talked about diversion uh, as, as rep reported to us by veterinarians. We've talked about uh, the rise in opioid prescribing in at least one veterinary practice as a warning signal to us. And we've talked about the call uh, for further action. Thank you very much. Thank you. At this time, we'd like to take questions for any of our presenters. If you haven't called in already, please call 1-800-593-8936 and enter participant passcode 9611836. 
Press star 1 and give the operator your name and affiliation. Please name the presenter or topic at the beginning of your question. Michelle, do we have any questions? One moment, please, to see if we gathered questions. And just as a reminder, again, if you're going to ask a question at this time, please press star 1 and clearly record your name. And it, please clearly state your affiliation and the presenter in which you're asking the question to. One moment, please, to see if we gather questions. Our first question will come from Jen Brown. Please remember to state your affiliation clearly. Your line is open. Hi there, this is Jen Brown at the Indiana State Department of Health. And my question is for our presenter um, on prescription um, opioids. Uh, it's been quite some time since I was in clinical practice, but when I was, I was in a small animal practice, um, and, and this was before Tramadol became a controlled substance in 2014. And because uh, it was not a controlled substance at that time, Tramadol was something that we dispensed very commonly, um, especially for dogs um, with indications for pain control. And I noticed in the, some of the data that you presented that, um, that after 2014, there was a pretty dramatic decrease in tramadol prescriptions and that the increase you observed in some of the other opioids seemed to correspond almost perfectly with this decrease in tramadol prescriptions. So, I mean, is it not possible that the, the increase that you observed was uh, simply a reflection of changes in prescription practices in, um, in veterinary practices that were a, a direct consequence of tramadol becoming a controlled substance and therefore uh, you know, less, less easy to dispense? Yeah, Lee Newman here. I think that's a, a, it's, it's probably the case that the reciprocal that we're seeing here, that rise in the prescribing of those other drugs, is a reflection of the, uh, the scheduling of tramadol. Uh, and the authors of this paper, which I want to point out, I'm not an author on this, on this paper from Pennsylvania, and I'm not a veterinarian. Um, but uh, they point that out as, the, uh, as a possibility and probably explains part of this. The part that's harder for me to reconcile is how, a pr how their group practice would have an increase uh, in number of visits of like 12, I looked it up, 12.8%, but the overall morphine milligram equivalent, in other words, the, the doses, uh, rose 41%. Our, you know, I, it's either we were uh, in practice, either veterinarians were grossly under-treating the amount of pain in animals when they were using tramadol and now realize that they had to quadruple the amount of drug needed to manage pain or there's something else going on. Uh, just looking at the, that, what's happening with the doses. Great, thank you. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 and clearly record your name for question introduction. As a reminder, clearly state your affiliation and the presenter in which you're asking the question to. Our next question will come from Chris Paddall. Your line is now open. Hi, this is Chris Paddock at Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and my question is for Dr. Forrester. Um, you had mentioned that I believe 26% of the admissions uh, to the at the emergency department or hospital admissions from the emergency departments uh, were related to non-venomous arthropods. Um, were you able to tease out what, in fact, they were being admitted for? Was this were these um, infectious diseases that the uh, arthropods were believed to be transmitting, or were they directly related to the the arthropod? Um, exposure. Yep. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, we, we were not able to tease out whether or not it was a, an associated infectious pathogen and there was just kind of cross uh, coding with the non-venomous arthropods. So, you know, we suspect that there are probably a large number of those bites that are not, you know, simple um, bites or stings, but are probably associated with an underlying infectious pathogen that's been transmitted. Okay. Thanks very much. Our next question will come from Karen Sussman. Your line is open. 
Hi, this is um, Karen Sussman. I'm a veterinarian, um, and I'm at the Center for Veterinary Medicine. I just had a question for Dr. Dubin. Um, in I have not um, read the paper that you were discussing, but in terms of kind of the incongruous um, rise in the number of patient visits versus the amount of um, opioids prescribed, did the authors at all discuss any change in the patient population since we do have kind of limited um, choices for pain management in animals. I do think there has been increased recognition of treating pain in animals, um, you know, over time, but whether or not there was any change in the patient population that maybe necessitated less use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for pain management and, you know, resulting increases in any opioid prescription? Uh, yeah, no, they, they did not report a, a change in that pattern. and. Um, Roughly speaking, about uh, around three quarters of the prescriptions were going to dogs, about 22% to cats, and uh, roughly 5% to exotic animals. That was their distribution. I, I should mention that overall, uh, the you know this practice per year was writing 10 million doses of you know in terms of tablets or patches, 10 million from one practice roughly on an annual basis. Um, so, you know, the, the, the scale of this is also, you know, pretty, pretty high. And, uh, I, you know, I'd put it to those of you who are veterinarians to, to you know, assess whether you think that that's uh, in some way representative. I think we're just going to need more data and look at that, that pattern as it changes um, for pain management by animal species. Thank you. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 and clearly record your name for question introduction. Our next question will come from Kathleen Fagan. Your line is now open. Thank you. Um, I'm Kathleen Fagan. I'm a medical officer at OSHA. I had a question for Joseph Forrester about um, how many of the uh, cases were work-related, and I think I saw like later in your slides that it was a small amount, 1.4 percent. Is that right? Yeah, so that's the the best estimate we can get. Using the ICD-9 codes, there's actually not a specific designation for work-related injury, um, and so the the kind of proxy that we've used both in uh, this study as well as in prior mortality estimates has been kind of this other animal category, which you know, studies from 15 years ago have shown have predominantly been large animals. Um, but unfortunately, with the with ICD-9 coding, we can't definitively say, you know, these are pigs, yeah. horses, goats. But with ICD-10, we suspect that, that that should be easier to kind of tease out. Um, but yeah, uh, from the the injuries that, that we were able uh, to identify as other, as other mammal, essentially, it was a relatively low percentage which so you, is kind of incongruent with the mortality data. Yeah, you don't have like other data like the work, if it's a workers' comp case, for instance. We, we don't, no. That, that uh, isn't available in the, in the NEDS data, uh, to my knowledge. I see. Okay. Well, that's too bad. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Currently, I have no questions at this time, but as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 and clearly record your name for question introduction. One moment, please, to see if we gather additional questions. And our next question comes from Karen Rosenfear. Your line is now open. Please remember to clearly state your affiliation and the presenter in which you're asking the question to. Your line is now open. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Karen Rosenshare with USDA APHIS Vet Services. This question is for um, the third speaker today. And I may have missed it, but I saw that the numbers for the human prescribed opioids had gone down between 2015 and 2017, that the MME numbers in vet prescription for opioids had increased between 2015 and 2017. Did y'all, were y'all able to compare to the overall report from the DEA for the state of Pennsylvania? in terms of did the overall number decrease, stay the same, increase? Just wonder if that can correlate uh, the impact that vet clinics have during that time frame. Yeah, Lee Newman responding. Uh, 
the, uh, the, the slide that I showed, uh, which I pulled from Pennsylvania uh, data for that period of time of 2016 to, uh, I think it was, or 2015 to 2017, shows that both the number of prescriptions for humans had gone down in Pennsylvania and the dosage units, the morphine milligram equivalents, had also uh, started to go down as well. Um, and, and just to kind of put the, uh, the, the rough numbers on this, um, if you look at the number of dosage units um, for uh, humans in Pennsylvania, uh, you're looking at for a year on the order of 400 million dosage units. Uh, and in that one study from that one Pennsylvania um, multi-person uh, practice, uh, they're looking at about uh, 10 million units per year. So, um, you know, I, I think that um, the, probably the, the thing that we need to do is to get data sets where we can really bring uh, the human prescribing data in line with the veterinary prescribing data uh, at the dosage unit level to understand uh, sort of the scale of, um, of the, the prescriptions and the drugs that are getting into the human community through animals. Uh, relative to what's happening in terms of um, the prescriptions that um, that medical doctors are prescribing directly to humans. That makes sense. It's very interesting research. Thank you so much. I think currently I'm showing no additional questions at this time. Thanks, Michelle. Um, that's that's great. I think we'll go ahead and wrap up the call then. Um, thank you to everyone for their questions, and thanks again to all of today's speakers for the excellent presentation. Thank you all. Okay, thanks. Um, instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu slash continuing education. The course access code is onehealth2019. To receive free CE for today's webcast, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by April 8th, 2019. A web-on-demand recording of today's call will be posted online by April 9th, 2019 at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu slash 2019 slash march.html. Our next call will take place on Wednesday, April the 3rd at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you for your participation. Please send suggestions and questions to zohucall at cdc.gov. For more information and to subscribe to our email newsletter, please visit cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu. This ends today's call. This concludes today's conference. Thank you again for your participation. Participants, you may disconnect at this time. Speakers, please stand by for transfer to the post-conference.